Phil. Hey. Hello. Good How morning. How are you? This is a pleasure. So wait a sec, where am I? What am I doing? And why on earth am I sitting next to Bill Gates? Well, I've flown to Senegal in Africa to learn how AI is being used to try and solve the biggest world problems. He's hosted this event called Grand Challenges, where he gets together lots of people with ideas on how to solve these problems, and then funds the projects that he thinks have the most potential. I have to say, I have always been very cautious about AI. But coming here the last couple of days, I've seen so many things where I've just been like, wow. This makes sense. So I read your blog post online and you talked about this idea that in your entire life, you've experienced two technologies that you would count as revolutionary. The first was when you saw the graphical user interface. And then from what I understand, that kind of shaped a lot of what Microsoft ended up becoming. But then the second was what you experienced with AI. What part of that made you so convinced that that was the second? There has been progress in things like picture recognition or speech recognition, what you might call fairly low-level things. What we didn't have is an AI that could read and write. I kept challenging the people at Microsoft OpenAI with the specifics like, can you pass a test? So you set them this task of like, solve this biology AP paper. It'll probably take them like years. And they came back in a few months. That's right. And that night we were like, whoa, now, what was especially cool about this is that the reason Bill picked this biology AP paper is that it's, well, A, particularly tough, but also B, it's one that can't be solved by just regurgitating information, which at this point is all AI could do. It required critical thinking, but that AI, it didn't just pass, it achieved the highest possible score on it. In fact, I think a lot of people in the last year have had that experience of saying, wow, what can it do and how do we apply it? In the vertical where we're seeing it, you know, most clearly is in coding, where as you type, it suggests things, it helps you with testing, and already people are like 30% more productive. I guess that brings us to here. So we're in Senegal, we're at this Grand Challenges event, and you know, given what you know about how powerful AI is, I guess you've decided that AI is a big force that is going to be used to also improve the world. What things are you most excited to use AI for to make a difference? The Gates Foundation is all about inequity, you know, including in health and some work in education. We're now focusing the foundation on saying, okay, who are the innovators who are thinking about tutoring African students or providing Africans healthcare where the shortage of doctors is worse here than anywhere in the world. And yeah. so if you can have advice to a pregnant mother or somebody who's experiencing symptoms, you can improve the health system. Now, you probably have like a thousand questions at this point. I did too, because like, it's a big thing to even suggest that AI can help to solve global inequality. Because with most new technologies, inequality actually gets worse. It's usually the wealthy that have access to it and can afford it and therefore benefit from it, while those that can't are left behind and the gap is widened. So exactly how does that work? Well, according to Bill Gates, there are four avenues in which AI can actually help to shrink the gap for farmer advice, educational tutoring, mm -hmm. patients directly using the AI, and healthcare workers using the AI. So those are kind of the four areas that now we want to bring those innovators together and help them. So for farmers, one key thing that AI can do is pull together the information from weather forecasts, satellite images, various sensors, and even specific news outlets to tell them in simple terms when they should expect a new crop disease outbreak so that they can actually take preventative measures. For education, we're very used to the idea of the classroom being one teacher, 30 kids in front of them. But in a lot of less privileged areas, it might be one teacher to 100 kids. And within that, there'll be a vast range of different capabilities. So AI can be each student's personal tutor. It can teach them what they need to learn at the exact level they need to learn at, effectively allowing the smartest kids to not be held back and the people who are struggling to not be left behind. Plus, with an AI, you can ask unlimited questions and not be worried about judgment or holding the class up. Or for another example, we saw an amazing example yesterday of textbooks not being localized to other languages. So a lot of these underprivileged countries, they don't have as good resources as we do in the West. But AI can not just create local language textbooks, but also create animated series where people are watching people who look like them and sound like them with their intonation explaining concepts at their exact level. Yeah, the tutoring capability you know, particularly for languages that in the past wouldn't have gotten the effort that English gets is pretty phenomenal. And mm -hmm. of course, it's not just text in, text out now. Now, you know, we're taking avatars and having them speak. We have speech going in. Mm -hmm. uh, so the additional modalities makes it even more accessible.
And then, for patients, AI can be a way for them to have some medical support when otherwise they might have none. If it feels like hospitals in the UK or the US are understaffed, because when you go in you have to wait hours before getting seen, then in some parts of Africa, turn the hours into weeks. The queues are so outrageous that, no joke, every single year, millions of people who are completely savable are dying just waiting to be seen. But think about it, if every single patient had access to an AI chatbot that was trained in medical procedures, then at the very least, while waiting for a doctor, they could at least take steps to stop things getting worse. Plus, the added layer for a lot of these countries is they have very low literacy rates. So just handing out medical leaflets or telling them to Google the solution isn't going to be very useful. But an AI a chatbot that can actually talk to them? That absolutely is. An AI that you can talk to in your own native language that basically does the internet scouring on your behalf and then just speaks the results back to you. The medical advice, whether it's your mental health or your physical health, your diet, you know, the fact that you can consult and, you know, get good advice on health things, that's really world changing. Do you reckon there's like an element of people feel a bit scared to bring some things up with their human doctors, but with a the chatbot, they're actually, they feel like it's a safe space. You know, with the chatbot, you're not going to meet them at the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it doesn't go grocery shopping. So first people worried that people would be less open with the computer and you, you do run into a tiny bit of that. But in most cases, like you're saying, it feels like, okay, it's private to me. Mm. Now we need to make sure we partition the data so we, we deliver on that promise. But you know, we can absolutely say, okay, this is only private to you. And then you've got the healthcare workers. So many underprivileged countries have a problem here, that they only have 5% of the doctors required to actually serve their whole population. How do you fix this? Well, build them AI tools that can save them on all their busy work. AI that can handle their clinical notes for them, for example. AI that can recommend the best course of action, so a doctor just has to approve it instead of writing the whole thing out. An AI that can have a look through every radiology scan before the doctor's even seen it. Which would mean that instead of the doctor starting from scratch effectively every single time they open up a new scan, they're actually starting from a scan that's already been pre-checked, with an AI having gone through and highlighted every single possible risk factor, at which point all the doctor has to do is to go through those risk factors and then decide if they agree or disagree with its assessment. AI that does this, it actually exists now and is already making doctors faster and less likely to miss things. Okay, hopefully you're starting to see that the potential here is great, but we also have to be really careful with AI. I wanted to touch on bias, because that's a question I had. How do we avoid bias in these new AIs that you're trying to help build? It is fair to say that getting data sets of disease prevalence and things like that into the models, that'll be important. And that's another role for the foundation. Mm. You know, the world's best health data set is one we fund at a group called International Health Metrics. And so we need to make sure that gets into these models so they're able to help people who, who aren't just in the US. And yeah, this is a really important trap that we need to avoid when using AI. It's very easy to be like, well, we've already got ChatGPT. Why don't they just use that in Africa? Why do they need to make new stuff? And yeah, I mean, aside from the fact that the average healthcare worker or farmer is going to really struggle to afford the premium subscription to use the best version of that. But also, most of the investment into AI across the entire world right now is happening in rich countries like the US. Now, that's fine. But what it means is that a lot of the data that American chatbots are being trained on is US data, which can distort the way that the chatbot responds to situations with a US bias. So I was shown an example of someone in Malawi in Africa who was using ChatGPT to try and figure out what illness they had. They typed in their symptoms. They said, I've got a fever, I've got dizziness, I've got headaches. And ChatGPT was like, well, you have the flu. That was incorrect. The person actually had tuberculosis, but because the rates of tuberculosis are so low in the US, ChatGPT didn't even consider it as an option. Now, bear in mind, this doesn't even need to be a conscious bias for it to be a problem. Like, just for example, if you say, trained your AI on global health data, you might think you're doing a fantastic job, but the problem is the richer countries report more health data, which would mean that as far as your AI is concerned, the problems in Western countries will be far more heavily weighted and will therefore become the focus. So ChatGPT can be the basis on which these new AI models are built, but there is still clear merit to actually training those models using local data. The other important question with all this AI stuff is, do you really want AI to be making these big, important decisions instead of a human? No. 
Not really. I think that would be a bad idea, especially for the time being, while AI doesn't have the reliability or the accountability that it needs. Which is why it's really important that all these tools that are being built right now, they're being built to focus on decision support, a way to help people make better decisions as opposed to decision replacement, making those decisions for them. But there is still one big question mark. If these AI tools in these underprivileged places can be such a big help, why has no one made them yet? So a lot of what you're seeing here is like a market failure. Or in other words, a situation in which leaving profit-maximizing companies to their own devices has not resulted in the best outcome. If there was a demand for a chatbot for students in underprivileged backgrounds, it kind of would have been made already unless a market failure was occurring. And then you're coming in and being like, we're going to fund projects. Exactly. And so philanthropy can find those things and get involved. Mm. And so AI to help Africans uh, that's another example where we can supercharge it. The foundation will make sure AI gets used for Africa, that there's not you know, a 10 or 20 year delay because the AI gets delivered through the cell phone over the mobile network. So we don't really need that much more hardware at the end user. We need some data centers. You know, we have to make sure that gets funded. Mm. Now, some of these innovators will figure out business models, but in education and health, philanthropy will be a, a big part of accelerating yeah. that. And there's two sides to this philanthropy. It's both to fund non-profit companies, like you probably see a lot of, but it's also for already profit-making companies because they're the ones who actually have a strong incentive to make better products and also be efficient because they have to worry about their own costs. It's just that in a lot of cases, these normal profit maximizing companies, they don't see any money in poorer places like Africa, so they never even try to invest and create solutions for them. So in the case of AI, because the potential for AI is just so massive, you could have a situation where the tools will all be built by the West for the West and the levels of global inequality will skyrocket to the highest they've ever been. And that is where philanthropy comes in, in the form of grants for new companies who want to start up with the objective of solving these problems, and in the form of subsidies for existing companies to help give them an incentive to refocus on not just the rich parts of the world. Got a quick rapid fire round for you. Okay. What phone do you use? I use a Samsung Fold. Oh, you use a uh, Fold? Yeah, it's pretty nice. Uh, <laughs> nice. What made you choose that? You know, I'm, I'm very PC-centric, mm. but sometimes I like to read magazines and news. Mm. And so that gives me enough screen. I, I'll go to my PC when I'm writing documents, but for reading, this works very well. Wicked. What's your favorite app right now? You know, I use Outlook a lot. Uh, <laughs> that's my sort of center. My kids criticize me for that. <laughs> One gadget that you can't live without. On well, my PC, um, mm. I'm still, you know, I like a big screen. Mm. Who's your favorite YouTuber? Uh, good question. Uh, wow, my favorite YouTuber. You know, I watch tennis, there's poker, there's mm. bridge, there's, you know, Ukraine. It's always just serving up just such a variety of things. Your favorite's the algorithm. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, that's dangerous. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Yeah, Phil. great this to see you. a pleasure. You.